I ask you the question that all youngsters ask at Christmas time. Does minced meat actually have meat in it? Well, no, not today, but it did. Like in this recipe from Victorian England for mincemeat pie. So thank you to Wondrium for sponsoring this video as we make mincemeat with actual meat, this time on Tasting History. So at the time that I'm filming this episode, Tasting History is getting dangerously close to hitting 1 million subscribers. Wow. So if you have already subscribed, thank you so, so much. And if you haven't, now is the time. So there are so many recipes for mincemeat pie through the ages that I really had trouble deciding which kind I wanted to do. Modern mincemeat doesn't have meat in it, so that's not very historical. But medieval mincemeat almost only has meat in it, and that just doesn't really remind me of Christmas. So I finally decided on a Victorian mincemeat pie recipe from Eliza Acton that has some meat. Mincemeat, author's receipt. To one pound of an unsalted ox tongue, or inside of roasted sirloin, add two pounds of fine stoned raisins, two of beef kidney suet, two pounds and a half of currants, two of good apples, two and a half of fine Lisbon sugar, from half to a whole pound of candied peel, the grated rinds of two large lemons, and two more boiled quite tender and chopped up entirely, with the exception of the pips two small nutmegs, half an ounce of salt, a large teaspoonful of pounded mace, rather more of ginger and powder, half a pint of brandy, and as much good sherry or Madeira. Mince these ingredients separately and mix the others all well before the brandy and the wine are added. So that is her recipe for mincemeat, and it makes like 30 pounds of mincemeat, so I'm pairing it way, way back. Also, she has several ways of making them into pies. Some are covered and some are not. I'm going to go for uncovered because I like the look of them. Now, if you are a fan of the channel, you might recognize the book that this recipe comes from, Modern Cookery for Private Families, because it's where I got the recipe for last year's episode on figgy pudding. Now, obviously, I cover a lot of Victorian Christmas food history here on the channel, but for some Victorian Christmas non-food history, I turn to today's sponsor, Wondrium. What once was the Great Courses Plus has expanded its library to become Wondrium where you can find thousands of educational and entertaining videos taught by experts in the field about everything from travel to science, literature, and of course, Victorian Christmas history in the surprising origins of Christmas traditions. I always have Wondrium playing while I'm cooking in the kitchen, and today was no exception. And while I was tinkering with this recipe, I learned that we send Christmas cards because in 1843, Sir Henry Cole was too busy to send the customary Christmas letter to his family and friends. Instead, he commissioned the artist John Calcott Horsley to make an illustrated card, being considered the first Christmas card. Even better was that it caused an outcry from temperance advocates because it featured a mother giving her child a sip of wine. So if you love learning stuff like this and so much more, make sure to start your free trial of Wondrium by visiting wondrium.com slash tasting history or by clicking the link in the description to get started, just like I'm about to get started on these mince pies. So for this recipe, what you'll need is a half cup or 45 grams of ox tongue or roast sirloin. I know which one I'm choosing. A heaping half cup or 90 grams of raisins, three fourths of a cup or 90 grams of beef suet, that is the fat from around the kidneys of a cow, and it's actually really wonderful and used in a lot of baking, but it's kind of hard to find here in the US. You can get it online. I'll put a link in the description to where you can get it, as well as a vegetarian version, but you can also just use butter. It's not exactly the same, but it works. One cup or 120 grams of dried currants, three quarters of a cup or 90 grams of apples, one heaping cup or 115 grams of sugar, three tablespoons or 50 grams of candied peel, one teaspoon lemon zest, a half boiled lemon, though you'll need to boil a full lemon, one teaspoon of nutmeg, a half teaspoon of salt, an eighth teaspoon of mace, three fourths of a teaspoon of ginger, two tablespoons of brandy, two tablespoons of a dark sherry, and then either short crust or rough puff pastry. She mentions both being used, so either one will work just fine. Also, this might come as a shock, but in this mincemeat recipe, you'll need to have all of your fruit and meat minced. I even cut my raisins in half just so they'd be about the same size as everything else. So in a good sized bowl, mix the fruit and the beef, and then mix in the suet, and then I find it best to mix your spices, salt, lemon zest, and sugar separately, just so they'll coat everything more evenly when you add it to the meat and the fruit. Then finally pour in the brandy and sherry and give it one last mix. Then cover the bowl and put it in the refrigerator at least overnight, but preferably up to a week. Honestly, you can actually keep this if you put it into sterilized jars 
for over a year, which is why she's making like a wheelbarrow full of mincemeat. Once the meat has rested, line a tart tin with the dough and then spoon in a bit of the mixture, then pop the tray in an oven at 350 degrees Fahrenheit, 175 Celsius for about 15 minutes or until the crust starts to brown. Now this recipe should make about two dozen pies of minced meat, a recipe which has changed quite a bit over the years. The mincemeat pie is but one in a family of meat pies that gained popularity in medieval Europe. The mingling of meat and spices popped into pastry was all the rage with the upper crust who could afford the crust, the meat, and the spices. These early pies were probably something like the chewets on flesh day that I made a few months back. Then at some point during the Middle Ages in a kitchen of some unnamed noble, a cook realized that if you add a bit of sugary fruit to the meat, it helps flavor the meat as well as preserve the meat. That's the reason that even today you could eat a mincemeat pie from 1974 and probably be just fine. So this mixture was a proto mincemeat, but the pies tended to be massive with about 90% being meat and 10% or even less being fruit, mostly figs, raisins, and apples. And they were called shred or shrid pies because the meat was shrid. Then around the Tudor era, the term changed to minced pies. A recipe from 1624 for six minced pies of an indifferent bigness called for mutton loin and leg of veal, and it included much more fruit than the recipes of previous centuries. And these pies seemed to be most popular during the winter months, which makes sense because that was the time when fresh meat and fresh fruit were harder to come by, and so the association with Christmas was inevitable. In his collection of poems on Christmas traditions, the 17th century English poet Robert Herrick wrote, Drink now the strong beer, cut the white loaf here. The while the meat is a shredding for the rare mince pie and the plums standing by to fill the paste that's a kneading. That poem has a weird cadence and I couldn't figure out how to read it to make it work, but there it is. And he warned that these pies were so good that they needed to be kept under a watchful eye lest they be purloined. Come guard this night the Christmas pie, that the thief, though ne'er so sly with his flesh hooks, don't come nigh to catch it. Unfortunately, as coveted as they were, the mince pie was about to hit some hard times brought on by some hard people, the Puritans. Oliver Cromwell and his cronies deemed everything about Christmas as popish falderall. And in 1644, Parliament banned all Christmas celebrations, accusing them of giving liberty to carnal and sensual delights. Which they do, God bless them. Well, in this blanket ban of all things carnal, of course, meat pies were at the top of the list. Now, there is an urban myth that says that these 17th century bans on mince pie were never actually lifted. And to this day, if you are caught eating mince pie on Christmas, the magistrate has every right to throw you in the clink. This is, of course, not true because there was never actually any ban that called out mince pies specifically. And even if there had been, of course, it has been repealed. But the myth persists. And it's perhaps because the writers of the time used mince pies specifically to ridicule the Puritans' ability to link absolutely anything to Catholic papism. Christmas? Give me my beads. The word implies a plot by its ingredients, beef and pies. The cloistered steaks with salt and pepper lie like nuns with patches in a monastery. Profaneness in a conclave? Nay, much more. Idolatry in crust. Babylon's whore. I do clutch my pearls. Now, one reason that some people think mince pies might have been so offensive to the Puritans was that in addition to being shaped like stars or castles or fleur-de-lis, some claim at Christmas the pies would have a decoration on top in the shape of baby Jesus, which was a puritanical no-no. Though it's probably more likely that this was actually an invention of later centuries. So who knows why the Puritans hated them so much. Now, while the shape and decoration of a mince pie may seem inconsequential to us, in the 17th century, it was a matter of life and death. In The Exaltation of Christmas Pie, the author tells of a man who found mince pies only safe to eat when shaped like little boats, that they might swim down his gullet the easier. And indeed, he was a mighty enemy to four-cornered pies, for he said they were used to stick in his throat. Also important was to eat them at the right temperature. My advice, my beloved, to you is that you eat them cold, for I have heard of a bridegroom that was killed before he could lie with his bride for adventuring to shovel hot minced pie down his throat for a wager. I find that completely believable. Now, as time went on, the mince meat 
dwindled and mince fruit kind of took over as the pie until the 18th century when the only meat that was used was a little bit of usually cow tongue or calves tongue or whatever meat you had lying around. But the danger of eating them never fully subsided. In fact, it just got worse. Mind you, in England and here in the US, mince pies remained popular despite their ever-blackening reputation. In 1860, a Reverend Thomas Wentworth Higginson wrote that mince pie is very white and indigestible upon the top, very moist and indigestible at the bottom, with untold horrors in between. And the woman's home companion declared, Positively, no stomach can digest mince pie without injury, and no intelligent woman in these enlightened days serves it to her family. They were considered so indigestible that an article from 1899 suggests that eaters of mince pie first ingest capsules of sand from the shores of Lake Michigan so they can digest food as chickens do. Mom, I don't feel well. Well, did you eat your sand today? I didn't think so. They obtained such a reputation that in the 1890s, the San Francisco Chronicle felt the need to publish a recipe for harmless meat pies. They are said to be hygienic and safe to eat. And if you ever read any recipe that opens with, they're said to be safe to eat, make something else. Now, a food that causes indigestion, while inconvenient, has never really hindered its popularity. I mean, I eat Chipotle all the time. But what if that food was deadly? One story from 1872 claims that a Michigan boy of only three years old died after receiving burns from a mince pie that his mother had taken out of the oven. Supposedly, she had failed to vent the pie properly, and it exploded. Now, I do question the veracity of that story, but one story that did happen involves mince pie and murder. Chicago, 1907, a young wife has been murdered, shot in the head by her husband, one Albert Allen. Was it self-defense, a lover's spat, or was it mincemeat madness? It was this way. I ate three pieces of mince pie at 11 o'clock and got to dreaming that I was shaking dice. The other fellow was cheating and I tried to shoot his fingers off. When I awoke, I was holding the pistol in my hand and my wife was shot. She had it coming. She had it coming. Sorry, I couldn't resist. What's crazy is that this indigestible, deadly pie was the most popular pie both in England and here in the US. In fact, it was the pie that was sent during World War I to US doughboys on the front to remind them of home. And it became really popular during Prohibition because there was a loophole that allowed alcohol into some canned foods. And canned mincemeat at the time had a 14.1% alcohol content. But with the repeal of Prohibition and as apple pie became the symbol for American patriotism, all talk of mincemeat pies retreated to British shores and YouTube channels about food history. So once your pies are baked, you can take them out of the oven and let them cool. Now you can eat them warm, despite the 17th century warnings against it. You can eat them warm, but you can also eat them at room temperature. I actually prefer that, and I bedite mine with a little powdered sugar for effect. And here we are, Victorian mince pies. They look so harmless. They smell good too. Let's have a bite. Mmm. Mmm. This is so much better than the ones that you get today in the store. They're so often today just like sickly sweet. But this, it's sweet, you know, it's a dessert, but it's more fruity and the textures are wonderful. It's not really mushy. Everything is soft, but everything is very individual. There is no goop to it. Also, I love the lemon. That is really what distinguishes it from, from a modern mince pie. I think it's the boiled lemon, maybe the lemon zest, but there is certainly that, that citrusy flavor without the tartness, without the sour, the sour quality. It's, it's just bright and, and really, really quite nice. What's interesting is that, so mostly I get like the raisins and the currants and the apple, and then at the very, very end, you get that kind of meaty, There, you, there is meat in it. But it's very, very slight, and I don't mind it at all. Because of the spices we used, it really does have that Christmas feel, but it's also different than, than what you usually have at Christmas. So really all I have left to do is take a cue from little Jack Horner, who sat in his corner eating his Christmas pie. He's stuck in his thumb and pulled out a plum and said, what a good boy am I? That kid had no problem with self-esteem. 
So thank you again to Wondrium. Make sure to follow me on Instagram, Tasting History with Max Miller, and subscribe if you haven't. I'd love to get to a million by Christmas because why not? And I will see you next time on Tasting History.